Yeah, so the downside of meeting face to face is short people like me suddenly feel a lot shorter, so it's mm -hmm. nice that we've got a stage here, mm -hmm. that's lovely. <laughs> um, okay, so as Joe said, uh, I'm going to focus down now a bit more granular on kind of the on the ground lessons and I hope that some of the stuff I can share from the mistakes that we've made but also the lessons that we've learned particularly through the Covid period will be useful for you guys because I imagine a lot of you are kind of battling with the visitor management challenges. Um, so yeah, this is Snowden. <laughs> oh, with that, we now call it, um, just to annoy people. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the, the last two years have been really insightful for me and for the team, for the National Park Authority. And I think what it's really taught us is where the thresholds and capacity is at present in the National Park. Um, it's, it's always been busy on Snowden. Uh, every year my team answers the press inquiry of here's a picture that's gone viral of queues to the summit. And if any kind of instructors here that regularly go up the mountain know that's pretty much every day. Um, but it makes a good story, doesn't it? So we've always been dealing with kind of visitor management challenges in the area. But it kind of hit a whole new level <laughs> uh, during the COVID period. And if we now look back at the data, um, I'll come back to that one. If we look back at the data, actually uh, what it showed us was in terms of total visitor numbers for the year, um, we didn't have more visitors during COVID, but we had them at quite accelerated specific times. And so basically, oh no, go back, there's a pointer. Love it. Anyway, okay, we'll go up closer. So this is basically where our threshold is, it turns out. Um, and what we then saw was more litter issues, parking problems, and various other challenges um, like fly camping, which was a new phenomenon <laughs> for that season. Um, but what it forced us to do was face those challenges head on. And I think in a way, COVID suddenly gave us a freedom to be able to try new things, to pilot, to suddenly drop that fear of failure. So you've been thinking about and talking about a problem for 10 years and nobody's bloody done anything about it. Oops, sorry, this is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't sweat>. um, <laughs> So, you know, it, and that is the most frustrating thing for me, having worked on the ground and then worked my way up, and, and this is what I'm always trying to kind of drill into my team and into the management team, is there's a problem. How do we actually change that? And any of you that have kind of come into this sector know that, um, you know, you can easily identify a problem, but making that change happen is incredibly challenging. Um, just a little thing about crowd psychology. Any psychologists in the room? Or a background in psychology? Yes, definitely helps <laughs> if you're managing visitors because it's all about people behaviour basically. And it turns out as soon as you have more than a certain amount of people together, they behave in a very different way. And you probably found this, if you observe yourself when you go on holiday for example, um, you might suddenly realise that you've forgotten how to cross the road properly. Uh, <laughs> so as soon as you have over a certain amount of people together in a crowd, they will start following each other. They will start following the same sort of behaviour. So this could apply, for example, to parking your car. Um, if you have, <laughs> if you have uh, one car parking somewhere on the side of the road, and there's a lot of people in that area, they will all start doing the same thing. Understanding that and knowing that that's what people are going to do is really helpful in kind of shifting the, the, the way that you manage people and what you put in on the ground. So when you're dealing with large volumes of people, you can no longer rely on people doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do because they will go into a mindset of other people are doing this, this must be the right thing. Um, so just zooming out for a second, 
in terms of how we think about managing visitors and sustainability within Snowdonia National Park. We're very lucky to live in Wales and to be one of the first countries in the world to have a future generations commissioner and essentially what this means and the well-being of future generations act which was established about 10 years ago is that everything we do in the public sector in wales has to consider all of these elements of sustainability so whenever i make a decision a policy decision i have to think about these and it certainly shifts your mindset um, when you start thinking about not just kind of what's directly in front of you but it, how it's going to impact all these elements of sustainability you definitely do things differently um, and one of the ways we shifted the way that we approach things in the national park is we used to be quite kind of silo in the way we did things so we need a management plan right let's write the plan think about all the issues we've got how are we going to deal with those um, now we very much approach that type of kind of policy and um, plan development in a partnership way. So who are all those people that have some kind of part to play in impacting the issue that we're talking about? You bring all of those minds together, you talk about how those problems can be solved and who's going to do what. Um, sounds easy, definitely isn't. <laughs> um, we started the first kind of iteration of this on Snowden. Uh, with the Snowden Partnership Plan uh, and that was 10 years ago now and it was quite a challenge at the time because there were so many organisations for just Snowden doing some really great work um, and we all were trying to look after the mountain but we are kind of heading in different directions whether it was the National Park, the National Trust, the Councils, Snowdonia Society um, and what eventually what it came down to was starting with, you know, what is the one thing that we're all trying to achieve? And, you know, identifying that and having this shared common directional goal that was really simple, uh, not like a super wordy statement that everybody gets bored about after two lines, um, was really critical. And essentially, we all wanted to look after the mountain and to make it better. So once we'd identified that, it was then working together to see who could do what to kind of aim for that. And we worked with the local communities to establish what the main challenges for them were as well and how could we address them over the long term. And any kind of strategy or plan, it takes a huge amount of long term commitment to actually deliver that. It's easy to write a plan, but it's hard to kind of keep that momentum going. Um, so you need to make sure that you've got that resource, you know, for five years ahead of you to actually be able, be able to deliver that. Because I've always said, um, if you're not, if you're going to consult, if you're going to ask people what they want, it's actually worse to ask people what they want if you're not going to do anything about it than, you know, to, to consult at all. And there is a real risk of kind of inertia in that. Okay, so making big change happen. Um, I've talked a bit about the Snowden Partnership and how we pulled people together. There was an element there as well of identifying who the kind of power players were in that, who had the kind of most influence over what could actually happen on that mountain, and making sure that those individuals or organisations were kind of pulled into that partnership, and that's been touched on earlier by people. Um, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is the weekend that... Uh, Boris Johnson announces, announced lockdown <laughs> and um, this is an urban clearway so it's a very busy road where there should be no cars parking and it, it just highlights I think the crowd psychology thing and it also highlights what happens when you don't get the infrastructure right that was when we didn't get the infrastructure right essentially Penna Pass which is kind of you could be going there this afternoon it's around that corner and, and um, just up the pass. It's got an 80 space car park and for years we've had people heading there trying to find a car parking space. It's the most, one of the most popular routes at the mountain. 
gets full, um, or it has traditionally got full over the last sort of five years by about seven o'clock in the morning, sometimes half past six, because um, you've got groups going up to see the sunrise, uh, you've got the Three Peaks Challenge, and when an enormous amount of people suddenly went, oh God, we're getting locked get down, let's have our last ditch of freedom, um, the amount of people descending on that area, finding out the car park was full, then park, one person parking on the road and then everybody else doing the same, uh, created a bit of interesting activity and news. You know, you know you've made it when you're on Have I Got News For You? <laughs> <laughs> or there's a kind of cartoon about you in private eye. Um, okay, so uh, pre-booking, you'll be pleased to know, Janet. So uh, this was a very controversial thing that we did because 50% uh, of people, when, when we kind of explored the idea of pre-booking at Penapass, said, this is the worst idea ever, it's going to fail, and you're an awful national park. <laughs> And 50% of people said, oh my God, at last you're actually doing something about this. Um, it's worked really, really well. Uh, some people have kind of struggled with that sort of shift in it being more organised, whereas, you know, local people could turn up in the evening and, you know, go for a short walk. So we're trying to kind of uh, adapt the system to meet that. But in general, um, it's made life so much better for those visiting and for those managing the site. Um, we also doubled the price of the parking, <laughs> just for a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> just to upset people. No, um, so in, prior to establishing this, and just before COVID hit, we'd done a huge amount of work to look at how can we make parking and transport more sustainable in the Snowdon area, and that came from the Snowdon Partnership Plan. Um, so we had this kind of blueprint of, uh, from Martin Higgett, um, if somebody wants, anybody wants to see the report, I'm happy to share that, which sort of set out, this is how you could completely transform this area. Big change, big shift, and, and the essence behind it was, you know, essentially getting people out of their cars and into public transport and trying to do that kind of on the outskirts of the National Park, rather than having this, what has happened for years, of people kind of heading up and down the pass, trying to find a space to park when the car park's already full at, at um, half past six in the morning. Um, and so one of the things within that plan was uh, creating uh, better park and ride facilities with, with a buses running every sort of quarter an hour, half an hour, so people don't even have to look at a timetable. Um, and then the kind of car parks that are, I suppose, um, the most convenient and right in the middle of the National Park, tra transforming those into ones that were kind of a, a high cost, but would then be able to fund the, the additional public transport to make it better for everybody. A bit like Robin Hood's tax, basically. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, I'll go back. So, so we implemented that in response, actually, to that kind of terrible weekend. Um, and we did it as a pilot, and it worked incredibly well. We kind of adapted it um, this year, and we've got it running again this year. The buses run up and down every 15 to 30 minutes from Mount Paris. Um, you'll be able to see that later on this afternoon with Angela from the team. Uh, and I think the learning is, whatever you do, somebody, or maybe quite a lot of people, uh, particularly when it comes to parking, because everybody's parking experts, um, <laughs> will have an opinion about that, whether that works or not. And quite a lot of these things, obviously you need to think carefully about it, but quite a lot of these things you don't know until you try it whether it's going to work. And you could spend years trying to kind of refine the perfect system, but sometimes it's just about doing and being clear that you will adapt that system as it goes ahead, goes on to make it better. And, and that takes a certain amount of bravery and it takes a good communications team behind you to be able to do that because you need to make sure that you're communicating all of that really clearly to people. Um, it's really important as well to measure the right stuff. We, for years, have been me measuring in terms of tourism <coughs> using STEAM, which is kind of the standard measure, 
um, basically the economic element, but we haven't been measuring um, you know, the, the social impacts, the environmental impacts, and that became really, really clear during COVID when our communities were kind of lashing out, basically. At, we, we are really scared about all of these visitors coming to the National Park, um, and it became more and more clear about the kind of social impact of, of tourism. And if you're not measuring it, you don't know what the impact is. And if you're just measuring the economic, then we'll always be saying, you know, this is great, everything's fine. If we're measuring everything, um, then we can make edits, change things for the better. This is just one example of the new elements that we've added to our local theme report for the National Park which is um, what's the local population versus the visitor population. Um, so just to put that in context, if you visit London, um, it's got a huge population. Um, and so the kind of visitor numbers will feel less impactful on that big city. Um, whereas if you've got a community like the National Park where there's only 25,000 people and you know, six million visitors coming every year, that feeling of impact for that community is going to be very, very different. Um, so it's just being aware of, of those ratios, really, and thinking about how the local residents feel, because it goes back to that people feeling, feeling welcomed. Um, so, how much time have we got left? Five minutes. Okay, uh, right. Start with the infrastructure. <laughs> Where we've seen things go wrong, most of the time it's because the infrastructure isn't right. And your capacity um, and your thresholds will be very different if you've got good infrastructure versus if you haven't. If you've got a busy site and one toilet and you know not very good transport and a few car parking spaces, how visitors impact that site is going to be very different to uh, a site that has very good infrastructure. Um, and you also need to think about the carrot and the stick. Uh, and this comes back to the crowd psychology element. So um, you can expect some people to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So if you put a really good public transport system on that runs every half an hour, some people will use it because it's the right thing to do and they want to visit a national park and look after it. Probably most of you in the room would, would do that. But the vast majority of people will always go for convenience. Um, and so you have to make sure that you have some sticks in there as well. So the example of this in relation to parking and transport is have amazing bus services, but make sure that people can't park wherever they want. Um, and it has to be really, really obvious and simple to people. So nobody understands, it turns out, what a public clearway is. Um, they do understand what double yellow lines are. Um, so just make it easy for people um, to not break the rules. And that will help with how the visitors are managed. Um, this is our new Sherpa buses. It's a, I'm not a massive fan of the brandy. It looks like a Teletubby bus. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, ooh, fine. Um, also, little. This apparently is the Snowden Lily, but there we go. Um, it is very obvious to people, it's recognisable, and it's easy for visitors to use. And that's been a brilliant partnership um, between ourselves, Gwynedd Council, Conwy Council, and Transport for Wales, who have really kind of come to the fore in helping deliver an amazing public transport system in the area. And it, you know, the Snowden area, I think we've nearly got that nailed. Um, we're working on the Ogwen area now. Um, so in a few weeks' time, uh, the Ogwen partnership, which is a community partnership, are going to be launching an electric bus that's going to shuttle up and down from Bethesda every sort of half an hour, basically. And you know, that's a really important thing to think about is the convenience again of making it easy for people. So unless you have buses running every half an hour, um, most people, if, it's, if there's another option, most people won't use it because they have to look at a timetable. You know, if it's sort of every two hours, you're gonna, you're gonna be thinking about, well, what if my walk goes slightly longer and then I'm gonna have to wait an hour and 
58 minutes for the next bus. So just making it easy will make it work. Um, and it will also mean that more people use it and it will be more sustainable. Um, boots on the ground, obviously I'm going to be kind of quite passionate about this element, having come from a background of working as a ranger, but just keeping that contact between and, and sort of understanding of this is the reality on the ground, so that's number one, you know, speaking to your on the ground teams to understand to the minute how things are going, um, but also thinking about uh, making sure that you actually have those people around. Amazing group of people. This is the Snowden Volunteer Wardens. Um, I started this game when I was a ranger on the mountain, and that was 10 years ago, I think. And uh, you know, they're still growing strong. Six, 60 um, local people who go out on the mountain every weekend just to look after Snowden in their own time. Incredible. And uh, it does make such a difference to have that volume of people out there helping. There's only so much you can do with staff, but you have to have staff to manage schemes like this. So volunteers aren't the kind of magic answer to everything. You have to have that coordination as well. Okay, uh, final quick one um, before I finish. Um, I'm going to try and make this not too depressing. So. <laughs> Um, at the beginning of the season, we were looking at right um, another visitor campaign for this season. And first, we needed to understand what people's understanding was of visiting the countryside. Um, so YouGov do a daily survey of 2,000 people across the UK, and you can pay them to ask extra questions. It's surprisingly good value for money, and it get, gives you a huge kind of swathe uh, of the population. Um, So we asked them uh, what their understanding of kind of countryside rules were. Um, it was quite low, <laughs> uh, and there were particular issues. I'm sure you're all aware of this, but there was particular issues around fly camping, uh, access to water. Uh, they they were the mo main ones really, and and I think a little bit of kind of what you should do with your dog when you're out in the countryside. Um, we also asked them, now that you're aware of these rules, uh, how likely are you to follow them? Um, also quite low. <laughs> um, and so the, the non-depressing thing about this is if you understand your audience, you can um, tailor your message to that. So if you understand that people might not necessarily uh, want to follow those rules, you can kind of shift the message to trying to gain and get them to gain an understanding of why they should be, um, but also maybe targeting at the people that you are most likely to be able to influence because they do want to follow the rules, they just don't know what they are. But there is a huge challenge there nationally to be able to shift that understanding. If you have more people helping you get those messages out, you can also have a huge impact. These are some of our amazing ambassadors uh, so we have an ambassador scheme for Snowdonia so outdoor instructors helping us <coughs> spread those consistent messages we've got like 742 my team told me yesterday which is amazing um, and finally money talks so you can't do anything unless you've got the funding and basically what that involves is speaking to the right people getting your messages out there highlighting the issues almost for that then to become a problem that needs addressing by MPs or by your uh, local councillors or members, you know, that will make a huge difference to you. Final point, future challenges. One thing that I'll quickly um, talk about is, uh, you know, who's going to be using the countryside in the future? Who has been using the countryside over the last two years? Now, I think national parks have this reputation of um, kind of white middle, middle class hikers basically and it's actually quite true like we have in the past sort of targeted not just how we talk about national parks but what we offer in national parks to those people and they're very very well represented we're very well represented in this room and we need to make sure that other voices are heard because what I've definitely found in kind of making changes is that some voices are very loud, um, but some voices are very quiet. And unless you proactively go and find out what those people want, 
um, and what is going to make them enjoy the countryside and, I guess, behave in a way that isn't going to impact on local communities, then you're not going to be able to make those changes. Um, if you want to chat further about that, happy to do so. Um, so, that's how to co connect with me. Like, great to carry on these conversations. LinkedIn, Twitter, email, please do connect with me. Um, it'd be great to kind of share ideas. That's the biggest thing that I've taken over the last two years is we've all get, got the same challenges and everybody's got some amazing nuggets to share. Great. Thank you. Your turn. Um, so I think I'm inviting the speakers onto the stage now and I think we're bringing our own chairs. <laughs>